It's a pleasure to see all of you here, many familiar faces, many new faces. Several of you have introduced yourself to me and described how you're using vitamin D in your practice, Dr. Connolly of the uh, Newport area, and, and several others of you have uh, really uh, moved into the vanguard of the profession in terms of implementing the vitamin D uh, era in medicine. The, what, what I think we are entering is the, is the era of vitamin D. We've had eras in the past with the microbiological revolution after John Snow, an early epidemiologist, discovered that uh, people who drank tainted water were more likely to end up with cholera, leading Louis Pasteur and others to characterize and describe infectious diseases, which ultimately led to the uh, discovery by Fleming of uh, uh, penicillin for the treatment of those diseases and the microbiological revolution came into fruition then. And the work of uh, our earliest of Lind in 1760 followed in uh, the early part of the present uh, or just past century by um, Joseph Goldberger discovering uh, the cause of pellagra as uh, being a deficiency in niacin uh, heralded the uh, beginning of the nutritional revolution. Uh, but it fell uh, backwards somewhat during the most recent century as more emphasis was placed on other types of etiology. But now I think the time has come. We are beginning a golden era in medicine and public health, and that I hope will be known as the era of vitamin D as we learn the extensiveness of deficiency, the breadth and depth of the vitamin D syndrome that's been described to you today by Dr. Gorham. And uh, you also understand the physiology of vitamin D now, uh, or have had it reviewed for you in, in the previous uh, talks, so, uh, including Dr. Haney's. So I would like to, uh, to plunge right into the, one of the most difficult, or originally most contentious issues in the whole field of vitamin D, and that is the question, can it prevent cancer? I have no uh, conflicts of interest. And the sources are available at the end of this presentation. Um, but this is where it all began. And I happen to be one of the few individuals that can place uh, 30 years of uh, career on one moment in time. And it was a moment that Frank Arlen and I showed up at the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health on Wolf Street in Baltimore. We'd driven across America in an old Mustang, and we'd just gotten into town, and we were told there was going to be a seminar given by Robert Hoover of the National Cancer Institute. And we went to the seminar, and as you heard before, it was a map like this that he showed. Uh, it happened to be uh, colon cancer because he showed the sites that were uh, present in both sexes first. And, uh, the, of the organs that were present in both sexes. And we saw a picture like this one. And you'll see the presentation is going to be full of graphs and pictures because we believe that a graph or a map is worth at least a 1,000 words. And what you see here is this concentration of cases in the northeastern quadrant of the United States. All the red are the areas where it's um, colon cancer death rates are 23 up to 30. It's 30 like in New York and in Long Island. And uh, then it gets real low in Arizona and New Mexico. And this is what struck us the most, because we had just driven through Arizona and New Mexico and taken the searing heat and realized that that's the, the most insulated, the place with the greatest amount of sunlight in the United States. So we superimpose these black bars on the map. And you see that's a region of 500 calories per square centimeter per day of total sunlight reaching the ground. And as you'll note, within the 500 cal if, if you scrutinize it a bit, within the 500 calorie uh, contour, there are no red areas. There are no pink areas. It, it, you know, it's, it's extremely absent. Uh, in that area. But then as you get a little high, a little less light, you get to 400, you begin to see an occasional uh, county pop up. And there are 3,056 counties in the United States. So it, a, a county will pop up now and again. And then when you start to get up to 350, at least in the, in the northeastern quadrant of the United States, then you see uh, the blood of the patients that have colon cancer shown as red. I don't know why they pick red for it, but it, you know, one can imagine there was a mnemonic of some kind involved. And we realized there, that's where our career would be. My brother and I almost simultaneously realized at that moment that we had to figure out why it was all red in the, in the upper right and why it was so blue in the lower right. But having driven just across the country, we formulated the hypothesis virtually instantaneously, although it took uh, 30 years to prove it that, uh, <laughs> that the sunlight was a factor. 
One of the great barriers at first was something that is obvious to anyone in the audience, I'm sure, and that is, well, why is it in the upper right and not in the upper left? And uh, Dr. Haney had previously alluded to this, and that led to 10 years of modeling the atmosphere and understanding the reasons. And what we concluded, and uh, ultimately were able to show, was is that uh, the combustion of high sulfur coal, which is mined in Ohio and Pennsylvania, West Virginia, uh, places like that, it's a bituminous coal that contains a lot of sulfur, like the original coal in London, withdrawn from, um, uh, well, you've heard of carrying coals to Newcastle. The original London coal was from Newcastle, full of sulfur. It kicked off the rickets, the first identification of rickets, and the rickets epidemic in the 1500s. And here we have the same thing happening with this high sulfur coal. It comes out into the atmosphere. It stays there between 3,000 and 5,000 feet. Sometimes people got, get stuck in it, like John F. Kennedy Jr., who lost orientation while in that haze, although there were no clouds that night of, of note, while flying along the Long Island uh, Sound and ultimately uh, toward uh, Martha's Vineyard. And uh, other pilots who were up at night saw that. But it's there almost every day. NASA has pictures of it now. And it's a cloud of sulfur dioxide converting to ammonium sulfate. And it, and it, really, it absorbs vitamin D in such a way and scatters it that you just don't get, or ultraviolet B, you just don't make vitamin D. The other reason is uh, that the presence of that type of air pollution serves as condensation nuclei for clouds. So if you ever look at one of NASA's pictures of the, of the, the U.S. from the air, you'll see that that area, the, the country is almost always enshrouded in clouds. And clouds are even more effective than ozone in blocking the transmission of ultraviolet B, as well as other parts of the spectrum. So that's the other reason. The indoor lifestyle in the region probably contributes. And if you need a whole list of reasons, the last one is the uh, Canadian continental air mass, which is an Arctic air mass during the winter, which moves down into the northeastern quadrant of the United States, making it so chilly that you can't expose any, even the 8% of skin that we normally expose consisting of our hands and head. <laughs> And, uh, and then finally, if that wasn't enough, uh, it happens that in the northern hemisphere, ozone piles up in the northeastern quadrant of every continent. So in the northeastern quadrant of the United States, the ozone is markedly thicker than it is in the southwestern. So you take all those things together, and that's why you get all the red areas in the upper right. That does not apply to the upper left, to the, the northwest. Uh, the air is clean, having come off the ocean. The ozone doesn't pile up here. Uh, and uh, for those reasons, it's, it's uh, both bilaterally or, or unilaterally as well as north-south distributed. Well, this turns out it's also true for breast cancer, and the speaker didn't get to it until he started to do the sex-specific sites, by which time most of the people were asleep because they didn't, they happened to have missed that one. We were lucky. We were awake when we saw it, but the room was very hot, and the, it, was, it was one of the pre-air conditioning buildings or else there was a power failure. And everybody was just about asleep. By the time they got to this one, the total audience, except for my brother and I, who had been kind of, you know, and really joyed, jazzed up by seeing the other one, were still awake. Well, we looked at this and we thought, well, you know, it's pretty much the same. If you look under the 500 contour, they're pretty much blue. There's a few exceptions. And, of course, Southern California is a magnet for people from the north. Uh, eastern part of the country, and what we concluded was that some of these folks had come here <laughs> for the weather or the movies or what have you, and, uh, and, and got the disease as a result of that. And there, there are probably some other factors, too. But uh, we didn't let us dissuade us from st sticking with the hypothesis, which actually mainly was that when you get rid or when you stay below the waistline of America, which is this 37-degree line, you're not very likely to die of breast cancer. Well, we thought this was a great revelation that we'd tell the world about this, and that people would start to take vitamin D, start to measure it in their blood, pay any attention at all, but it was met with total silence. Nobody was interested one little bit in it. There's just a few people here that heard about it in those early days, and were uh, fortunately, um, I guess you'd say, indulgent of us. But um, uh, Bill Grant was looking through the uh, ph philosophical literature, and he found this wonderful quote from Schopenhauer. <laughs> we're not quite at the third. And we're somewhere, we're beginning to come out of the second, but we're not totally out of the second, I would say. There are still people that, are, that we encounter on the road that are just violently opposed. 
Um, but anyway, so th this is a typical example. And here we go. I'm going to show you a bunch of, of dose response relationships to let you know that this isn't like one study, but it's, it's actually uh, for this kind of association, just about every study that's been done of it. But this is pretty much what they look like. And this one is Tangria et al. And this is a study done in Finland with support of the National Cancer Institute. And they just looked at the odds ratio for colon cancer according to the serum level of 25 OHD. And uh, what they found was is that as the serum level went up, and this is Finland, so these levels were really low, the risk of colon cancer went down. And uh, when we first plotted this in a study that we did in, uh, in the 1980s, uh, we saw the same thing. And the dots were so close to the regression line that we, uh, the investigators couldn't believe it. They thought, oh, this one is theoretical. It can't be. Because these are usually there, you know, there's more wobble than it's seen here. But we think that this is a, it's almost a mathematical relationship of some sort, even without a theoretical grounds at that time for it. And that uh, as you crank up the 25 OHD, you crank down the risk. And as you can see, it doesn't take too far to get to a point where you're at 0.4. And uh, so uh, this one's by, by the, it's of the Harvard cohort, um, one of the Harvard cohorts by Feskinich and her colleagues. And uh, it's sort of the same thing coming out. You find the point's quite close to the line. Sometimes just for fun, we do a, a coefficient of variation, an R squared, to see how close these points are to the line. And for colon cancer and serum 25 OHD, it usually comes out around 95%, 90 to 95%, meaning that 95% of the variation in the risk of colon cancer is being accounted for by the serum 25 OHD level. Not to say there aren't other factors involved, but if you like to you know, boil it down uh, to its essence, this will account for, for uh, almost all the variation in the population without even taking into account you know, fiber or fat or all these other factors that makes it play some role. And this is, uh, well, this is from the Women's Health Initiative. And uh, let's see if there's, yeah, there's the line. And the computer draws these regression lines. And um, while the Women's Health Initiative didn't find any effect of the intervention, didn't find much of an effect of the intervention, although if you look at it, in comparing pure intervention with pure placebo, you see the effect. But uh, fortunately, serum was collected. And the results are similar. As you go up with your 25 OHD, uh, even up here to around you know, 22 or 23, the odds ratio just keeps going down. And uh, at one time, we, tr you know, we extrapolated here. But uh, one of our colleagues said, oh, aren't you happy with 50%? Can't you just leave it like that and let the people you know, kind of uh, extrapolate with their eyes? So that's what we're doing. But we don't have any reason to believe it's anything other than linear from all the studies that have been done. We do meta-analyses like this. This is a forest plot that uh, was in one of our papers. This was computed by Sharif Moore. Sharif, are you here? Sharif here? Well, Sharif is in town. We may see him a little bit later. But uh, this is what we found. And, it was kind of interesting. We were so excited when we did our original study in 1989. And uh, uh, fortunately, the Lancet accepted it. And none of us realized that it wasn't statistically significant uh, until we did this meta-analysis. <laughs> and and one of this, the, uh, the analysts told me, you know what? Your study wasn't significant. Well, it wasn't. Uh, we were just lucky that we uh, um, had a good editor that saw the value of the, the dose-response relationship and not merely the p-value. But then it was, this was repeated in this cohort by Braun et al. It's not quite statistically significant. But then since then, the studies have all been uh, statistically significantly beneficial. You take them all together, it's a reduction by half in the risk of colon cancer in people that are in the top uh, quintile. Easily achieved with a small amount of vitamin D. And here we go again, these graphs that we see that we almost say, well, get the, get the data, you know, this looks too theoretical. But actually, these are the data. This is the dose response gradient for colorectal cancer according to serum 25 OHD. And if you take all the studies, uh, this is what you get, 34 nanograms per ml. Um, if you're from Europe, this would be uh, approximately 80 uh, nanomoles and uh, is uh, consistent with reduction by 50%. And um, this is the N. Haynes cohort. And this is uh, something that hasn't been noted that much. But it turns out that if you uh, look at the N. Haynes cohort, you find that people who are getting greater than 32 nanograms per ml, or if you like, 80 nanomoles per liter, 
are, they only have a, a fifth the death rate from colon cancer. And this is probably what caused our, our, our maps that we showed you earlier, the maps that we showed you earlier, uh, to be, from the NCI, to be uh, so bright, is that uh, it, they were mortality maps, and the effect is even stronger for mortality, probably, than it is for incidence. So yeah, hey, you can knock out 80% of the death rate in, in a country or a practice by keeping everybody at 32 or higher uh, in Europe, 80 or higher. Uh, this is uh, a, a, the, the Nurses' Health Study and the Health Professionals' Cohort Study, the two major <coughs> Harvard cohorts. And just to give you a feeling of how this dose response goes on, uh, here one would really want to get up to 40 nanograms per ml uh, to, to see this benefit. Uh, and uh, now we're talking about 100 nanomoles per liter. And that 100 nanomoles will cut the incidence of colorectal cancer death in half, according to the results of these scrupulously followed cohorts that really constitute the, the world gold standard for cohort studies in our view. Not because of these findings, but that's a generally acknowledged uh, truth. And one of the principal moving forces behind this study, Walter Willett and uh, Edward Giovannucci of Harvard, have both signed on to the uh, statement that we gave you earlier that everyone should be at, in the range of 40 to 60 nanograms per ml or 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. Um, they are completely convinced of the, the validity of that uh, point of view. <coughs> and this, some of you may have seen this. This was just in the British Medical Journal. And we just got the slide, so uh, I'll, you know, there's, you, you're just seeing the, the raw data just as it came out of the raw picture. But the pattern is very similar uh, to what you see for the other uh, studies. And this study has, this is one of those studies that has almost as many authors as subjects, but there's so many thousands of subjects really that when you see it, you think, because there's some 30 authors, and uh, you think, oh man, another one of those, but this is the real thing. And even the authors who included some of the most vociferous opponents of the vitamin D hypothesis have together acknowledged that this is a confirmation of the accuracy of the vitamin D uh, relationship to uh, elimination of colon cancer. Stated maybe a little more broadly than they would, but generally that idea. Well, let's move on to breast cancer because, doggone it, the effect is the same for breast cancer. Most of the effect is for what some people rather dismissively call plain old breast cancer, POBC. And we talk about this, people say, oh, you're working on POBC. Well, plain old breast cancer is what we get. You know, 80% of cancer is plain old breast cancer. It's either ductal or lobular adenocarcinoma. We believe that that's coming from this, but it's not that different from colon. In fact, our R squares are right around 94, meaning that 94% of the variation in risk of breast cancer is accounted for by your serum vitamin D. So, you know, you may want to do a lot of things, but you know, if you want to not get the disease, you want to keep your serum 25 OHD as high as you can here within a reasonable range. Here's 52 uh, nanograms per ml. So this is about 125 or so nanomoles per liter. And we don't see any, any indication that this is going to stop going downward. We just aren't showing it uh, for conservatism uh, and to please one of our co-authors. Uh, this study happened to actually <laughs> go a little further, though. So we're actually, when, when, when this line was drawn, this regression line, it goes down to, uh, golly, you know, it's about 0.15 or so. So that, that's a 85% reduction in risk of breast cancer associated with uh, getting up to about 60 nanograms per ml. Um, so 150 nanomoles would, would be a reasonable target based on this study uh, done in England. Uh, hazard of death, these are, uh, uh, here we're getting a little bit into treatment for those of you that are involved in treatment. Uh, if a woman's 25 OHD is less than 20 nanograms per ml uh, at baseline, uh, she's in the re she would be the reference. And a woman who's th at 30 or greater nanograms per ml is only going to have 0.58 times the risk of death um, during follow-up. So, it's kind of you know, uh, clear to me that no one who has breast cancer should be allowed to remain in this range when we know that this range is associated with nearly half uh, reduction in the chance of dying at each point along the survival curve. Um, the, the most important study in recent years for 
um, the uh, development of proof and final certitude regarding the association between vitamin D and cancer it was done by Robert Haney, Joan Lappy, and their colleagues. And uh, we're so, so pleased to be able to report it. Uh, you've heard a little bit about it. It's 1,200 women in rural Nebraska. Uh, baseline serum 25 OHD was 29. Uh, the investigators gave vitamin D3, 1,100 IU, and calcium, 1,450, uh, or calcium alone or placebo. And they were interested in all cancers except the minor skin cancers. Well, in a population like this, the postmenopausal women, what you see is breast, lung, colon, that sort of thing. And these are the results for uh, the uh, um, time that, that they were followed. What you can see is in the placebo group, about 8% developed cancer, whereas in the group that they got calcium and vitamin D, uh, only about 4% developed cancer. So, just doing this in just four years cut the incidence of cancer in half. And this includes some very nasty cancers that are, would have not only made the women miserable, but would have killed them. Um, and this is for a four-year follow-up, including everyone. But no doubt a skeptic in the group said, well, what, how could it work that fast? You know, if we, let's exclude the people during the first year. I wasn't in on the meeting, but uh, Inevitably, there was some discussion like that because you always have your own skeptics. If you don't, the journals will provide them. But uh, <laughs> here's a placebo group, and here we see that this is excluding the first year, which is it's a standard procedure now. And uh, you, you'll see that the way that I interpret this is that about 9% of the people in the placebo group died, whereas if we look at the calcium and vitamin D group, you know, it's, it's far less. And uh, it's about, let's just take it across here. So, uh, yeah, about 5%. So relative risk is 0 0.40. And uh, uh, so it's very clear from the data in this study, without question and without the possibility of any confounding or alternative explanation, that calcium and vitamin D at the doses used, D3, uh, dramatically reduce the incidence of all cancers. And this stands as a monument. This is. This study if, if, uh, is at the, right at the top of uh, 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 the, the list of studies that confirm the vitamin D hypothesis. We're so pleased that, that uh, Lappy and Haney and their colleagues did. Oh, here's all except first year, I'm sorry. So uh, an extra slide got in there. Please bear with me. If you were in the placebo group, you had an 8% chance of dying. But this was after the skeptic's exclusion, which was to leave out the first year cases. And now we're only down to uh, about 97, only 3% of the people that got calcium and vitamin D uh, ended up with uh, the outcome uh, compared to uh, 8%. So I certainly wouldn't want to be in the placebo group, given the choice. Would you? <laughs> and the relative risk now is 0.23, meaning 77% of the cancers in the group uh, followed here, which excluded the first year, were prevented. And this may be the most valid estimate of the potency of even this small amount of vitamin D to produce its effect. Well, I'm almost at the wall, uh, but we've got a few more minutes, so we'll go on, about 10 more minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna go into these, but I'm, I'm gonna just, they're in here, so if, if uh, so you know that we did find some negative studies but they were crazy things to me. They were people eating pickled herring in Finland, or they were poor people in China that had almost nothing to eat and were eating weeds that contained vitamin D. Um, it was, you, you'll find some exceptions if you look hard, but uh, the exceptions are um, really minor compared to the, the vast uh, majority of the findings, but they're here for the record. Um, so how does it work? This is the second question I wanted to address for you today. The first was, does it work? And I believe those, those graphs show you that it does. You can get rid of at least half, and in terms of breast cancer, more like 85% uh, with uh, vitamin D, uh, particularly plain old breast cancer. But how does it work? Well, for years we've had this mutation theory. Every kid knows it, that there's a mutation to the DNA, and the next thing you know, there's cancer. And it's, it's the broken down car theory. Uh, you know, if, like if your water pump goes out, that car is gonna stop. And that kind of reasoning has been extended to cancer to the point since 1902 that something has happened. A rock has gotten into the fan belt and that's why we have cancer. 
Well, this eventually evolved into the so-called mini-hit theory, where, well, it wasn't one rock, but you need a lot of rocks, and eventually the car pulls over to the side. And uh, this, is, this is the present theory, actually, the mini-hit theory. It's a mechanistic, deterministic theory saying that you just, got, you just knocked out too many parts for the cell to be able to inhibit its growth, or you somehow managed to fire up a part of the cell that enhances its growth. Well, we, want, we believe in a different theory, our, our little research group, and that is, is that the, it, this process is driven by the great engine of all biology, of evolution. This is the 200th anniversary of the birthday of Darwin, and uh, there have been Darwin celebrations around the country, and while we haven't attended them, we feel like we have a kinship with them because this theory is based on Darwin's thinking to a large degree. So the idea is, is that the first lesion is not damaged to the DNA in vitamin D deficiency, which, as we've said, is universal, uh, practically, but that um, it's harm to the intercellular junction. And what the, one of the great beauties of vitamin D is that its metabolites upregulate tight junctions, little structures that hold cells tightly adhering to one another. And when it's gone, the cells don't adhere as tightly to one another and go back to being, well, they're human cells, but they also have all the DNA acquired in billions of years of evolution that allowed them to lead a unicellular life, which was 85% or so of the time that life has been on Earth. And so they can, they can look and they can be pretty independent as well. Um, natural selection is then unleashed because the cells aren't cooperating, they're not in lockstep with one another, they're not inhibiting each other's growth. And then all you need is natural selection for the, the cell with the highest growth rate to predominate. And we calculated that in 9,000 generations, any cell with a 1% selective advantage would occupy the whole tissue compartment. It's sort of like compound interest or nuclear fission. It's, it's a process that requires a surprisingly little evolutionary edge for a cell that has growth or reproductive advantage over other cells. To, to add, to put icing on the cake, if the cell is able to acquire resources from neighboring cells or membranes by lysis of those cells or membranes, which some cells can by the secretion of high aluronidase and changes in pH, that cell can prosper because it can reproduce even more rapidly. So natural selection is the engine, and we call the theory the dynamite theory. And uh, this theory has several steps, and I'll, I'll step through them here with you and then in a little more detail. But the key difference between the current formulation of the theory of cancer or carcinogenesis is that initiation, which by that name used to mean, or it still does for most people, the first step is not really the first step. But the first step is the loss of tight junctions. That's a consequence of vitamin D deficiency and calcium deficiency, and particularly if it's both vitamin D and calcium that are deficient, because tight junctions are upregulated by vitamin D and are absolutely dependent on adequate calcium in the extracellular compartment to work. Uh, and so that's the first step. This is the initial lesion of cancer. Now, initiation can come along. And certainly you can put cells under an X-ray machine and you'll get a lot more genetic variation, which speeds up the process of evolution. People who grow poinsettias know this very well. Uh, you add radiation, you can get much faster evolution. Then natural selection, uh, again, the great engine of all biology. If there's just a little difference in advantage, that cell will become the clone that dominates the tissue compartment. Overgrowth, unfortunately, what happens then is that the mass becomes palpable because those cells which have been selected for rapid reproduction have a very short doubling time, and next thing you know, you feel a mass in your breast, uh, or you get a polyp in your bowel. Uh, metastasis, almost every organism eventually engages in remote colonization. Uh, our Mars lander program, fortunately, which was quashed at least temporarily, is an example of uh, an organism getting ready to colonize. Involution, now if we're lucky, uh, it, it, actually many lesions probably that arise, whether in the breast or other tissues, probably undergo in, involution. This ha would happen seasonally. If someone's indoors and the tight junctions are broken, there's competition, the tumor begins to develop. But then the, the vitamin D come back, comes back. As long as, there's, as there are receptors for the vitamin D metabolite that's relevant, um, there will be inhibition of growth. And this is probably both 125-dihydroxyvitamin D as well as 25-hydroxyvitamin D by mass action. And then uh, if a person stays with a high level of vitamin D, and this is again theoretical and rather hopeful, but there might be coexistence of a uh, tumor clone with normal tissue because even though it has developed the ability to reproduce rapidly if uninhibited, uh, if the tight junctions can be restored, tight junctions block uh, 
reproduction and the tumor could be frozen in time. Types of junctions, well, you all know, going back to medical school or dietitian school or whatever, that there are all these different types of junctions and the most uh, important ones are the tight junctions. These are under the control of vitamin D. When vitamin D levels drop, these disappear. And people thought, oh, what happened to them? Well, actually, they're endocytosed, just like landing gear on aircraft. And they sit here, but they're just not there. The cells begin to drift apart. They lose communication. They take a less cuboidal shape. Here's a better picture of them. You can see their outgrowths. They're actually, uh, we believe, uh, a highly evolved cilia and that their original function was to allow the conjugation of unicellular organisms. But once it was discovered that conjugation was so useful, uh, it ultimately led to the development of multicellular organisms. So there, and it turns out that there are a lot of different kinds. Uh, my favorite is the flamingo coherent, coherent which passes seven times through the, the membrane bilayer, uh, just to make sure things are really tight. All of these are upregulated by uh, vitamin D and are dependent on calcium because they have hinges that don't work unless there's enough calcium in the extracellular fluid. And it's, it's a kind of a sharp drop off. If you put a, a calcium ionophore into the medium, uh, all of a sudden you'll see the cells will pull apart. They really, it really hasn't been studied adequately the extent to which intermediate uh, amounts of calcium affect this, but certainly the hinges don't work in the absence of calcium or when it's extremely low. And the cells pull apart, they begin to compete. Now, if you're, interested, if you're interested in genetics, these are just you know, a few of the 200 um, gene products that are upregulated by vitamin D. And you can kind of pick your favorite. You know, there's a dehydrogenase here that uh, clears um, uh, some, uh, some hormones that might be carcinogenic. And people who are interested in the hormone approach are interested in that. There's an increase in a, a factor that's thought to be a, a, a binder of a factor that's thought to be maybe carcinogenic and uh, a whole bunch of other mechanisms. The one that interests us most is E-cadherin, which is, has a 12-fold upward uh, regulation by vitamin D. And this is a summary of the theory, and uh, it starts out with our cells all sticking together very nicely with tight junctions. These were only discovered in this century. That, uh, a professor who ended his career at UCSD, um, George Pilati, discovered them, and he, he just passed. Uh, a few, uh, two years ago. But in, under normal circumstances, when vitamin D is insufficient, these are endocytosed, the cells are still there. But then natural selection begins to occur. There's just that population dynamics where one cell, which has that little edge in reproduction, begins over, be, to be overrepresented in the tissue compartment. Tissue compartment is a, a crypt in the bowel. It's a terminal ductal lobular unit in the breast. It's a unit by which uh, the structures are organized. Well, finally, the, the, the area where this is going on gets so crowded that there's penetration of the basement membrane, uh, probably because these cells are obtaining essential amino acids from the basement membrane, which is when you get far from a capillary, the only place you can get it. And they're not trying to break through it. They're just trying to get the essential amino acids they need to maintain their outrageously high reproductive rate. But a consequence is that a hole develops, unfortunately, in that membrane that would normally prevent a precancerous lesion from moving into what we would call cancer. Um, there's a stromal phase, and you, know, you can see this pathologically. These cells get into unfamiliar territory, but they have such a, uh, an advantage in reproduction that they grow and grow and grow. Eventually they penetrate more membranes, they get into the lymphatics. Unfortunately, the lymphatics transport them to places where they are fatal, and we get this last phase of colonization, unless somehow we were able to arrest it. <laughs> well, it says you raise it from a mutant seed, so a mutant, uh, the mutant status of DNA gets into it, but it doesn't require a powerful carcinogen, it doesn't require extra radiation. It can happen actually probably through infidelity of reproduction. So we could spend the rest of our you know, scientific careers or the age looking for carcinogens and we're not gonna find a solution to breast cancer or bowel cancer from it. Uh, so this is just a little animation showing how you lose the, the connections between the cells and then the cells begin to reproduce rapidly and they get crowded, they're you know, multinucleated because they're trying to reproduce so fast. You look at them, you see cells with multiple nuclei. But finally, as they begin to eat up this membrane, they get these essential amino acids which the cells cannot synthesize, then this hole opens and the pressure in the tissue compartment 
and the pressure from the reproduction of these cells cause them to penetrate it, and unfortunately they get into the circulation. Most of them are killed at this point, even in the lymphatic circulation by the, the force of the current. But some of them manage to make it to a lymph node, and they can grow there, and then uh, they expand in the lymph node, and eventually, of all sad things, they get into the lymph node, I'll go back one here, and uh, elsewhere into, into the body where they can kill the patient. The first thing you need to do is update your CV. I guess he's grown some, a way to get out of the water, <laughs> and some, some legs, a coelacanth. So here's the rule of thumb for those of you that are practically oriented. This is the amount of vitamin D you need per day on the bottom versus on, uh, on the vertical axis, what you need to get up to a desired value, like 60 nanograms per ml, and you need 6,000 IU to do that. This is an approximation. Dr. Haney is uh, the groundbreaker in this field, and you can use other rules of thumb, but this is one that's in use. A little bit conservative. Lifeguards have 60 nanograms per ml, which requires, if you weren't on the beach outside, 6,000. IU vitamin D3 per day, probably where we're going, if not higher. Ask your doctor taking a pill to solve all your problems is right for you. Well, for people that actually have the syndrome, it, it, it could be all their problems are almost. Uh, so where do we put the, the point where uh, our, our group feels people ought to be? Uh, right at about 50 nanograms per ml, understanding that there is a whole region up here that is probably quite safe and probably more efficacious if you are willing to extrapolate. Uh, but that you don't want to get much below it into this blue region. And uh, we're often asked for like advice on what it ought to be, and this comes from a, a consensus of uh, 40 uh, international uh, scientists and physicians who specialize in vitamin D. 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. Oral intake up to 2,000 IU per day. We're staying with that for the moment because of the Institute of Medicine, but if they do not change that, uh, then uh, other organizations are going to propose uh, higher levels going up to at least 4,000 and safe levels of up to 10,000. Uh, six cups a day of fluids. You don't want to be told that you forgot to tell me to take the fluid and I got that kidney stone, even though the kidney stones are totally unrelated and probably prevented, generally speaking, by what you did. If you have a breast cancer patient, draw the blood, get the serum 25D to know where you're starting, get the calcium, and even if possibly ionized calcium. Start the patients right away on at least 2,000 IU a day, because you'll be with the Institute of Medicine, and 1,000 milligrams a day of calcium, or higher if uh, the uh, standards of the uh, osteoporosis consensus conference uh, demand it, and as long as they're not hypercalcemic. Titrate the vitamin D intake, and you know, this is a process of engagement until you get it into the 55 to 60 range. Retest for vitamin D and calcium monthly until you're convinced it's stable. And for selected patients, uh, consider suggesting for not more than 10 minutes a day, going outdoors near solar noon, which is where we, when we're in daylight savings time, it's 1 o'clock p.m. civil time, weather lying with 40% skin exposure. And many people have done calculations, including us, based on body surface area, and we know that uh, this much will maintain, a, a, uh, based on calculations, will provide 10,000 IU a day, uh, a reasonable amount, and that's only 0.75 minimal erythemal dose. Fluid intake at greater than 1,500. Well, this, the story ends where it began. We're back with this map. We're back with one of the highest burdens of breast cancer in the world, in the United States, particularly in the northern tier, and, and no one doing anything about it. We know of no one in the world that is offering vitamin D as a means of prevention of breast cancer despite 30 years of work on this. So maybe some of you will get that fire of inspiration and say, I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to take it anymore. Don't you have any sense of urgency, as Carol Baggerly says. And get the word out to your colleagues, to your patients, to members of your community, that we are needlessly allowing people to go through the, the misery of treatment and the misery, in some cases, of impending death and premature mortality when we could prevent almost all of this, 80% of plain old breast cancer, probably 99% of colon cancer. That one is, I say duck soup, as Kenneth Singh here, every, I have a student, every time I say duck soup, he smiles because he loves duck soup. Uh, we can do it. So thank you very much for your great attention. And I'll be glad to, to entertain any questions.
My name's Andrew Davis. Oh, good. Yeah. I've listed myself as a naturalist, okay, so I'm outside of the profession. Very good. I heard your talk on UCTV last year, and in there you reiterate, you said that the seven past flamingo cadherin was your favorite one, the seven past flamingo cadherin? Yes, in terms of the art of it, but I, I'm happy with any cadherin okay. because they're all upregulated, and any one of them can stick the cells together. Is that the tightest junction between the of, of them all? Actually, since it's passing, passing through seven times, I would imagine the evolutionary pressure that resulted in that rather interesting structure must have been that it was, but I don't think anybody has determined how tight it is versus the other types. Okay, so, uh, and then you said that you needed to have adequate vitamin D. What, can you quantify that? What, what blood serum level of vitamin D do you need to get? Well, at least 40 to 60 nanograms per ml to keep them intact, and below that then there's less upregulation. Okay, and you also said more work is needed on it. Though, in sir. your last talk, that epidemiologists like to extend the line where it crossed the x-axis at zero, and all of those seem to cross at around 100 nanograms per milliliter. They all cross the line about that. Per nanograms per milliliter. Uh, well, that's interesting that you noted that. Actually, some of them cross even, you know, sooner, uh, even sooner than that, yeah, like right. 80 to uh, 100 nanograms um, per ml. And in your model, you have been there maintaining tight junctions. Why isn't 100 nanograms being proposed as a minimum level for vitamin D blood levels? It's because we just don't have that curve yet, and it's a compelling need in the basic science. To, to do that curve. So we know on the horizontal axis, you know, for a given serum level or level in the extracellular fluid of uh, 25 OHD, what the patency of the tight junctions is. But that it just hasn't quite been worked out. There are people that are developing dyes that will make it easier, including Roger Tsien here at UCSD. But uh, there hasn't been the motivation to do that. Just are there any five years, there are some five year studies out. Are some of these studies targeting uh, uh, studying people with uh, calc with uh, vitamin D levels that high in their blood level, do you know? Uh, the only one that's, that has a whole lot of people at high levels is a grassroots health de-action cohort. And that's exploring and defining the higher levels, 60, 70, 80, and so on. I'm Dave McCarthy. I'm, an, uh, I'm a family physician in St. Louis, and I teach uh, uh, military family physicians about vitamin D and been doing so for several years at the national meeting. There are four things I want to tell you that indicate how successful your efforts have been. First of all, your slide is, in my 35 years, the transformative slide for me. When I saw that slide, saw the incidence of disease reduction, so many things fell into place. And so I appreciate your allowing us to use that slide at each of our meetings. Thank you. Um, uh, vitamin D 25 hydroxy has passed all American laboratory records now as the single most ordered biomarker. <laughs> and worldwide, it's the fastest growing biomarker. The sales of vitamin D are up five fold in four years, and this year it's approaching a quarter of a billion dollars. And D is cheap. So that's a lot of D. Walmart, uh, uh, America's largest re uh, retailer, is now routinely stocking the 5,000 unit uh, Ds. Uh, and keep in mind, that's with the 400 uh, unit being listed, uh, you know, the ridiculous daily uh, amount uh, uh, by the government, uh, 2,000 being the tolerable upper limit, and they're selling the 5,000s. Um, the uh, Governor Mike Huckabee is a vitamin D fan. I had a chance to spend several hours with him in May of 2008. In between and Ken Cooper and I, we educated him on D, and he's written about it in his most recent book, the one called Do the Right Thing, page 187. <laughs> half a page. Make a note. <laughs> yes, sir. Half a page talking about uh, vitamin D. He gets his information correct. He uh, read the talking points well. Uh, and he's been talking about it nationally as he goes around and gives discussions on, on health care, and he and his family take it. Uh, the Air Force has made great strides in the last few years. They went from a consultant's division that thought that this was a fad when we first talked with them about it in, in 2007, to now the Air Force has brought on staff a specialist in micronutrients to specifically address the impact of micronutrient deficiencies on health. And the other day I was talking with the Air Force Surgeon General and he said the top of the list for study is D. Very good. Oh, bravo. 
Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Cedric, um, the I in your dynamite is involution, and I don't think you talked about it very much this morning, uh, but I may have been wool gathering when you were doing it, so I apologize if that's the case. Um, uh, it's been known for a long time, 20 plus years, uh, certain colon cancer cell lines maintained in tissue culture uh, go into a normal tissue type if you add 125D to the culture medium. And for that reason, before we had this comprehensive picture, it, it was common to refer to vitamin D as, a, as the calming hormone. Uh, I think it's worth elaborating, if you would care to, about um, uh, why vitamin D may work in people who already have cancer. Uh, uh, can you uh, carry sure. that a step further? Oh, be pl I mean, to. because if, you, if it was just a matter of preventing it, then you have to go back to when the thing sure. starts. Sure. But a lot of, I mean, as 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 uh, uh, the as the colleague who spoke just a few moments ago, we're all developing micro cancers all the time, and the important thing is what kind of cancer fighting apparatus do we have going to work for us? So, uh, I, uh, can you elaborate on the eye of your dynamite? Thank you for that question, Dr. Haney. And the question is, uh, why or in what way could vitamin D help with a cancer that's already a cancer? Uh, well, the reason that it can, and as he mentioned this, pathologists and other scholars of tissue see this all the time, where there are uh, tissues that look like they have cancer, but there's no threat at the time to the individual. Uh, fortunately, uh, most cells, even the clones that are rapidly dividing and have expressed the uh, enzymes that allow them to uh, lyse nearby tissues, also have the vitamin D receptor intact, the 64 kilobyte receptor and the kilobase receptor, and it's, it's quite robust. It, it can sustain quite a bit of damage and still function rather well. And so the majority of those cells, until we get into the extremely poorly differentiated tumors, uh, do have the vitamin D receptor intact. So the, part of the problem with the cancer is the continuing evolution of the cancer. And the reason the continuing evolution can occur is because the cancer is behaving with a sort of a crowd um, dynamics. The cells are able to compete with one another. So in each generation, the most rapidly reproducing, most aggressive cells, uh, are successively favored by natural selection. Well, once you put vitamin D into the system, that all stops because the cells are stuck to one another. They can't compete with one another. They will undergo a normal life cycle that includes apoptosis, and it is as though they were in the original tissue and as though they had never turned into a cancer. So that is a, you know, a great hope for treatment of cancer, and, and Kimmy Ning and her colleagues at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center found that uh, People that have high levels of 25-hydroxyvitamin D at diagnosis are only a half or so as likely to die over the next eight-year period, um, probably because of that action of the vitamin D on the established clones. And even the study, your study with John Lampe, it's likely that in your population of postmenopausal women, there were some women that had a, uh, a clone already going and wasn't maybe doubled to the point where it was palpable, and you probably arrested it with the vitamin D. So um, I, I think we shouldn't give up hope for vitamin D as playing a role in the life cycle of cancer until um, it's sort of a never say die thing, until we know that, that those tissues, those cells do not contain the receptor. Um, we should assume that the life cycle of cancer in nature probably does have, an in, we believe, has an involutional phase, mainly due to seasonality. When summer comes along, all of a sudden tissues that could uh, compete with one, or cells that could compete with one another, are frozen in time, in interphase. They're not competing. There's the cancer is just stuck, as it is in many men. Uh, when you look at the prostate, for example, and that's why the, the, the that phase is there in the cycle. It's it's a hopeful phase. Of course, the individual could die of the metastasis before that. But in thinking of the life cycle of cancer in nature, the reason we have the I phase is is to accommodate those observations. And the last phase, uh, the T phase of transition is when we actually get to the point where there isn't this seasonal uh, up and down variation of the vitamin D metabolites, but rather uh, a steady state, which would be accomplished with supplementation or by other means. And then uh, as long as we maintain that high level, the hope is that we could convert the cancer from a, 
a peril or a threat to instead a chronic disease, like so many other chronic diseases, that we can manage throughout the rest of the individual's life cycle. So that's the reason dynamite <laughs> has those two last steps. And we hope that through the actions of the people in this room and others whom we speak to, that, that eventually we'll think of cancer as having a life cycle that doesn't end with death as a final event, uh, but with transition to a chronic disease. Um, hello, Dr. Garland. Uh, my name is Mike Vigil. Hi, Mike. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all. This is tremendous. Uh, it's my first time here. I'm a student uh, in public health, and uh, so my focus has definitely been uh, to definitely be a consumer advocate, uh, but to spread this information among populations that are uh, disenfranchised and uh, certainly underserved. But my question is, um, I had noted the, the medical doctor earlier who had mentioned Walmart. So I had seen a study, and I apologize because I don't know uh, the exact cited source, but they were talking about how um, in different supplement stores, when they had tested, randomly tested the actual, what was in these supplements, that if it, it varied widely if the supplements were not tested by U.S. Pharma. So I know that with a lot of different supplements, it can, it can vary widely, and I was curious whether or not, if you knew, with vitamin D supplements, if it's important to uh, go with manufacturers that are reviewed and tested by uh, the USP. Well, thank you for the question. My question is, is there a lot of variation in the actual content of vitamin D and vitamin D pills to the point where the consumer should be concerned? Um, well, yes, there can be. And uh, the Lappi et al. study set the example by analyzing the pills that were used in the study, which were marked as 1,000 IU. And it turned out that when Tai Chen and Michael Hollick looked at it, they contained a little more. It was 1,100 IU. And they also tested the calcium. This is a refreshing trend that you don't see in all clinical trials, where the, but it should always be done. The tablets should be tested. And my suggestion would be to find out what tablets are used in a trial which did what Lappi et al. did and Haney et al. And, um, and then you know that you have a tablet that at least on one occasion was tested uh, for its content. It's not difficult to test. And the other would be to uh, ask the, the government of each state, or perhaps the federal government, to provide a standard test. That, uh, if you want to get the seal of approval, that you would have your pills tested on a regular basis uh, to guarantee that it would contain the amount. Right now, all you can do is at least be sure that it's a pill that's used in interstate commerce so that you have some federal protection. Pills that are sold within a state do not have nearly the oversight. Uh, the minimal as it is, uh, as, as pills that are sold across state lines. Thank you. Thank you.